so far, what an interesting week we have here with the NASDAQ pulling back quite a bit. We're under last week's lows now and Bitcoin still in a tight range up near the recent highs. What do you think is going on here with the market sliding the way that they are? Bitcoin staying si stable sideways and volatility not really up off the lows. I think I think the market's really starting to price in growth slowing down like we had really hot growth over the last few months and i mean today we saw uh, growth get revised down gdp get revised downwards and that's why we saw that move we saw today um but yeah i think especially with bitcoin stagnating for the amount of time that it's been stagnating it's telling me that growth is not at that elevated super like euphoric place that we we had just like for the last three to four months and so i think our system is also sniffing that out uh as we mentioned in our last podcast the system has been um, showing slower growth and i think it's very evident now uh, we're, we're starting to really see that come into play here and it's worked out really well for us we did a size down um, just a couple of weeks ago in um, TQQQ, and it hasn't really moved since then. I think we're actually now below the area that we sized down at. Um, yeah, we we sized down on the seventeenth, right? So like we're pretty much back to where we were. Yeah, um, and we're now at mid vamp. Uh, if we do get a breakdown below mid vamp, we could see lower vamp pretty easily. Uh, that's a very realistic place for us to go. And maybe we'll get a Momo touch. We'll see. It really depends on uh, the trajectory of growth expectations. But as it seems now, to me, it seems like we are starting to teeter downward. Now, I want to kind of elaborate on what you just said there, right? So the you were you just said something about growth um, expectations being super hot the last uh, few months, right? Now, for those listening, what what um, Artie's basically saying is our model has been imp uh, implying a hotter than, than basically a stronger growth environment for the last few months, right? And that's not something you would see in regular GDP data because the GDP data is released quarterly, right? So by the time the GDP data comes out, it's already happened, right? But I think that the idea here is that even though the the, the figures we saw get revised down. So here's the GDP um, growth that we saw get revised down today to 1.3%. This was 1.6%. Uh, so it got revised down 30 basis points. Now, not necessarily um, very significant, right? Because if you look at the retail, uh, the real sales to private domestic purchasers, which is the underlying consumption in the GDP print, it did tick down too. But it's such a margin. It was such a marginal revision. It's still quite strong in comparison to, you know, where where we are used to seeing this being in times of real economic um, contraction slash borderline recessions. So it's still strong. And I don't want to allude to the to to what um, Artie is saying by saying like, um, it doesn't mean a recession's imminent. The reason we use our models and we don't follow the economic data that that comes out specifically. GDP, right? Because GDP is so delayed. By the time the number prints, it's already likely too late. Um, and when we talk about growth strength and, and, and um, the perception of growth, it goes beyond just what this GDP number is, is implying, right? So the market's going to shift with growth expectations. And if you can track the underlying um, directional push of those growth expectations, you can kind of get ahead of the curve. And that's what our system does. And it does quite efficiently. And we're able to uh, see exactly where and when um, impactful times arise where growth sentiment can shift materially. Like, for example, this last pull down we had, uh, a, pull, uh, a drawdown we had in, um, in April, growth expectations did not shift the way that they did on the way back up. So it's quite interesting. Like, we, could, we were able to pull back and bounce without, without really a, a major shift in in the overall growth um, outputs in our system. But once we got up to all time highs uh, and we chopped around up here, things started to shift. And sure enough, we spoke about that in the last podcast of things downsizing. But 
overall, look, growth is still robust, but it's not as robust as it once was. Now, does that mean that we're, we're still going into nowhere a... near a deflationary territory? Deflation or a recession, right? Yeah, Re like yeah. that's that's yeah. what we need for the bond trade to work. That's when we would go long bonds when we get that deflationary trigger. And maybe we're slowly working our way towards there, but it's still way too early to tell. And yeah, and this goes back to our original um, framework that we've been pretty much adamant about this entire year, almost a year now, which is the compound landing, right? So we're in stage three, three out of four stages. We're in the third stage. And that stage is the, soft, the normalization slash soft landing stage. And if the soft landing stage is achievable, then you can skip stage four. But this is a, a model that's specific to this environment with a very tight, uh, a fast and aggressive tightening cycle and a, um, an environment where the lags are continuously being baked in. And the idea that uh, we're going to get a soft landing is it merits on the, on the fact that the Fed is able to kind of rein in um, their rein in the policy rate without really spurring up inflation again, while also loosening conditions enough to support continued and, and, and uh, stable growth. Now, a lot of people are looking at things like, like, a, like a Bloomberg FCI index or whatever it may be, if the um, financial conditions index. And that's kind of nonsense. And I'm going to explain why. Because a lot of these financial condition indexes or indices, they have the stock market as a component of financial conditions, right? In terms of, of real economy conditions. And I think the stock market is a good barometer of the economy right of, of what's going on obviously it's i would you could even argue it's the best barometer of the economy but to claim that financial conditions are loose because stocks are up would imply that people have direct access to that capital when stocks are higher for example if if the stock market rises let's just say 10 trillion dollars in a year for households like it would that would be seen as a loosening condition for financial conditions because there's a 10 trillion increase in um in household assets. The problem is, is you can't really tap those assets. Now, yes, you can go through margin. You could take a loan out, right, against those assets. But unless you sell and realize those assets, it's not something that you can materially spend. So how it affects your spending is a completely different story. So I think when you use these financial condition indices that, that compile the stock market, you kind of distort the idea that, you know, just because your, your portfolio is at all time highs doesn't mean it's cheaper for you to get a mortgage. Right, that doesn't change. Or to borrow, to buy a car, right? Um, access to capital is not has very little to do. Now, you might get a better rate if you have more assets, but ultimately, um, we're talking. You know, we're talking about fighting between subprime and, and and quality credit. We're not talking about like like drastic interest rate changes here. We're not talking yeah. about getting a mortgage at three percent for a seven percent, right? So. I think that that's a big driver that a lot of people overlook. They like to look at this FCI index and say, oh, financial conditions are loose. The Fed's not, the Fed's too loose. And, and that would imply that the Fed cannot be in a restrictive state if the stock market's at all time highs. And I would argue that that is, that's a nonsense because the times where the market is severely off all time highs and the Fed is restricted, that's when they're overly restrictive. I think that we've seen the Fed cut rates at all time highs. We've seen the Fed hike rates into a, in, into bull markets, and the markets continue higher. So, and and they tame inflation in the process. So, I don't think you can really correlate the stock market location and the the direct implication of Fed policy. Therefore, ultimately, you can't use st the stock market in your and your federal uh, in your um, financial condition indices. But well, where, back to where the, do you where do you see stocks going if uh, growth continues to deteriorate, but not fully? deteriorate to levels to recessionary levels so slightly lower from where we are right now um but inflation slightly ticking up like uh we, we're seeing now container shipping container prices rise again um, we're not really seeing commodities rise but if commodities start to rise again where do you see stocks going in that situation so i want to go to your the container point for a second uh, the container prices this again it's a very beautiful circle of life. This is making its rounds on X again. And this is ultimately just back to where it was in the first quarter of this year, early first early Q1 of 24. Back the when it didn't back matter then either. <laughs> back when it didn't, right? It went up and everyone said inflation is going to, you know, we're going to get an inflation resurgence. 
And I would argue that, I mean, let's look at the inflation rate, right? I would argue that we have not seen no any type of inflation resurgence this entire year. If you're talking about 20 basis points on a year-over-year -year, um, rate, a resurgence, I, I think you've, you're you're mistaken, in my opinion. But I think that this this container index again, you know, like you just said, I think we're going to have to see a, a, a move further in a, a harder reversal on other services and or and or. Um, uh, commodities, energy, and food to really stimulate a higher inflation uh, or a reinflationary environment, which I don't think we see that at the moment. We've been very adamant about this inflation situation. Like everyone's look, everyone likes to look at the inflation chart and say, "Look, we're 140 basis points over the Fed target," and they like to point to that and be like, "The Fed, we are so far from progress." But what they won't tell you, and what nobody wants to pay attention to is we are 600 basis points off the highs, right? 500 basis points off the, off the 2022 highs. Now, is this an achievement? Yes. Is it a major achievement? No, I would argue that, look, that we, there's still work to be done here, but it's not, this is not the end of, of all, uh, be, end all or be all here, right? We're under the 2011 peak of inflation. So back in 2011, inflation peaked higher than where we are today. In 2018, we are about 50 basis points above the 2018 peak. And we are well below the 2008 peak and the 1990 peak. So if you look at it from, from a perspective of where inflation has been, where it's entrenched and where it is likely going, I mean, we, we know that we're seeing, gonna, gonna, it's likely that we see continued how, uh, uh, services, uh, disinflate, excuse me, it's likely we see continued disinflation in housing services which again, support lower inflationary figures. It's likely we see some uh, tailwinds for disinflation emerge from commodities in the next few months. Again, positive for the overall disinflation trade. So when you look at it like this, it doesn't really look like inflation's that problematic. And I wanna go back to your point where you said, what happens if growth goes down and inflation ticks up? I don't think, I think the growth deteriorating is honestly the, the, get, the, the crap shoot here. I think that the inflation reaccelerating part is probably like the tail event, not the growth decelerating, right? Like, so the inflation reaccelerating is probably something that would be um, would be abnormal to to to, to see yeah. at least in this but, point. But in time, growth right? deteriorating further is something that's somewhat expected. Yeah, I mean, look, we we went over this in the in the last podcast, right? Uh, for those that are that are listening, you probably want to go check that podcast out where we go into detail about our system. But long story short. Um, our two growth metrics, one of them is has been flatlined for a while, and the other one is slowly inching lower. Um, it's on the it's on the lower range of its strength score, so it's obviously weaker than what what we've seen here the last couple of months. So, yes, there are a lot of signals that are saying the look growth is probably um, at at a weaker stage right now. Now, it can very well reaccelerate, and that's something that like we are not in the recession camp. We're in a slower growth camp that could lead to lower equity prices, but it doesn't necessarily mean a recession. And until our models signal otherwise, we are positioned accordingly. And that's something that I think a lot of people will get stumped on, right? So they're going to think, oh, it's either risk on, bull market, brazing bull market, or it's a hard crash recession. And that's not how this works. And that's why like, our model is very um, particular in how it positions and sizes up and down and accordingly. And we manage that emotion free for this reason, because obviously based on what I'm telling you guys, it might seem very convoluted, like, oh, growth is slowing, but it's not bad. What do I do with that? And that's why um, it, it's, it comes down to how the model wants to take it. Well, I'm just reading, I'm just basically relaying to you guys what I'm seeing being displayed in the model. The positions are the positions, my opinions don't change the positions. I'm just reiterating what the model is producing in figures. Now, Let's even talk, go a step further and talk about the, the Fed funds futures for December. The dot, we're well below the dot plot target, which are the last dot plot target from March. So obviously everyone knows that there are, there is not currently three rate hikes, a uh, three rate cuts, excuse me, priced in to the uh, 2024 year for Fed, for the Fed funds futures. So we are well below three three cuts i mean i think we're borderline one cut right now which I and mean, we've been saying that that is a policy mistake and uh if growth really does continue to t deteriorate we're gonna get proven right that that was a policy mistake 
um, we're, we're now seeing growth starting to slow down and the Fed still hasn't cut once. Well, and just remember. There's going to be policy lags. Just remember, we have the dot plots coming up at the next meeting. So w- there's also this scenario that not many people are talking about right now. And that's this. Look, the, the economy obviously is not that strong as it once was. Okay. And um, our models are signaling deteriorating growth and they tend to front run the data, right? Um, uh, because the, the, the data that the Fed likes to use, most of it is uh, lower frequency. So we focus on higher frequency, right? So the data that we're watching signals deterioration. By the time the Fed picks up on it, usually it's a little, it's, it's a bit late. But ultimately, if this continues, the position here is the Fed will have to cut before the summer's over. Maybe it's July. Maybe maybe it's at the end. Maybe maybe it's in September, right? But the idea is that if this path of growth deterioration continues. It ultimately will show up in the data the Fed is looking at, and the Fed will say, okay, maybe it's time to start the cutting cycle. And I think a lot of people are like, oh my God, the first rate cut, it's over. Like the Fed's going to re- reignite inflation. They're going to lose c- control. You have to understand something. We just went over infl- inflation is at 3.4%. The Fed is at five and a quarter. If the, the, the Fed is not bound to any rules, but they portray themselves to be so, meaning the Fed is an organization of credibility right so they want to be credible now we can argue how credible they actually are but what they want to do is they want to lay the frameworks out like powell laid out at the last meeting the next move will likely not be a hike could the fed hike yes the fed could do whatever they want right but like they're not the the objective here the point i'm trying to convey is just because the fed has historically run a run a cutting cycle where they cut at every meeting doesn't mean they have to do that again so what happens if the first rate cut in is, I don't know, July, hypothetically, and they cut 25 basis points, and then they wait three meetings to cut again? The problem with this is the Fed is at a position right now where I don't even want to say they're wrong. We can argue that it's a policy mistake, but it's the, it's the policy mistake that's already happened, right? So like if it's a mistake or it's not a mistake, it doesn't really matter. Growth is still technically, I mean, we're looking at good consumption figures. Uh, still positive growth, right? So yes, we we might agree it's a policy mistake, but the macro-based approach is going to say, look, um, it's obviously not bad. The economy is still chugging along for now. So the Fed has the Fed has not technically blown the limit, blown past the the the, uh, the red light here, right? Like they, they're still within bounds to possibly come in and cut rates and prevent a further deterioration in growth. Maybe it takes a maybe the unemployment figures. Um, in the next in the next two prints are going to signal look the fed should be cutting rates and then maybe the fed enacts one rate cut all it takes is one rate cut and this is where we're going to play the uh the complete gambit to the other side right so if the fed cuts rate one the first rate cut the market is going to run with it run with it as soon as the fed cuts one time the, the you know we're going to go to from pricing in um four four cuts in 24 in 12 months to eight cuts like in in uh, probably in a week Right, because yeah. that's just how that's just how the the market works. Yeah, you're the gonna have gonna go people running up. around getting variable rate mortgages right away as soon as they mm-hmm. cut once. <laughs> right, exactly, and I think that we have to kind of let let this play out because this is such an abnormal thing. I and look, all cycles are different, right? But this is just an abnormal thing where the Fed has been able to ultimately bring inflation down much closer to target without severely impacting the um the unemployment the labor market outside of job openings really getting decimated, right? They haven't really been able to blow, blow. they haven't blown out the the uh, labor market in the process of bringing inflation down and they haven't really destroyed growth. I mean, there was a period in 2022 where the market front ran this idea of a recession, but the da- the actual growth figures did not support it. At least the consumption, the consumption side did not go negative as we've seen in prior recessions. So we were able to stave off a recession there. And I think that's just unique, right? Look, like the Fed's in a position where is this, is stage three, uh, a possibility to be the final stage in the compound landing. It always has been. We said that since day one. Do I think it's possible that the Fed can land, can can kind of unwind this mess somewhat softly? Yes. Do I think it's likely? Probably not, because the Fed is going to sit here and wait for the data to show them that they are restrictive enough and they can reduce rates. Now, that might be too. That likely will be too late. And we have Fed speakers saying they don't need to see inflation at two percent. 
to start cutting rates, but that's not necessarily how this works. Inflation has this tendency to fall very hard, very fast when the economy materially slows. So this, there's, a, there's this big consensus out there uh, or a large consensus out there saying like, oh, we're at a higher, we're, at, we're basing at a higher um, normalized inflation rate. And that's, that's very well possible. It's not, it's not, un, it's not impossible, but tell me that I'll believe that when we have a recession and we can't get inflation down to down, down to the target. Like we're sitting here debating about if 3% is the new 2% when we have not had a recession yet. If we get a recession and we can't get back down to 2%, that's, that's where the proof in the pudding is. But like, don't sit here and, and, and get all wound up about a, a higher normalized inflation target when we have yet to see um, a la- a, an entire labor market slowdown and, and, and forget about disinflation, a straight deflationary push for a period of time. Maybe it's only a quarter, maybe it's you know only a, only two quarters, but we have yet to see that even come to come to fruition. So I think it's very hard to make claims that, you know, it's not like the recession has passed us. You know, a lot of people, what they do is they look at the stock market and they say, oh, we had a recession here and inflation wasn't able to get down to three to 2% high, new normal. That's, we did not have a recession here. You had a, a skewed recession. You had GDP print barely negative and consumption pretty much struggle along with one, with one haircut of a negative print. Th- this is what recession, like these are what recessions look like, right? Like we, we can go, you can go back in time and look at this chart. And you can see that there has to be a material slowdown to the downside in growth for there to be a real recession. And I think that this, the stock market was afraid because obviously the GDP figures were already negative and the market front ran that. And no one really expected these consumption figures to remain so resilient. And I think that what happened was we were in this stock market bear market, not economy bear market. And once the stock market figured out the economy wasn't in a bear market or wasn't in a recession, it was just a stock market. It was a stock market recession, not an economic recession. The, it may, we can argue it was possibly an earnings recession in terms of like earnings slowdowns, but it wasn't a broad enough economic slowdown, right? And sure enough, once the market figured that out, it was off to the races to the upside. Literally, like we reversed this entire, what was this, a year? A year we reversed in three, in th- in three or four months. We yeah, it was a basically year the, yeah. the stock market thinking that we were going to enter in a recession. And then as soon as it realized we're not, it's like, okay, time to catch back up. Yeah, and then here we are now. And now the, now the big question is, look, does the recession actually come? Does stage four actually come to fruition? And you guys have to remain open-minded. This is not a fixed-minded ball. Like, this is not a sports game that has all the rules laid out. If you break one rule, you're out of the game. Like, things are much more dynamic than you wish they were honestly and they are that they, they are just because it's the stock market right it's not, this is not a rule based thing and you have to look at it like this if if the market if growth can can continue its its path of slower degradation but not really falling off a cl- cliff and the fed can notice it quick enough and the fed can start acting they can bring down rates now the only question is going to be when they start cutting rates do, is there enough um is there enough action done in the forwards market to kind of accelerate the lag? Because we already know that like the Fed hiked from zero to 525 basis points in pretty much the, the rate of change in the Fed funds rate was the highest that we've ever seen, right? In terms of just the, the velocity, just, just everything about it, right? So now the where we are on the level, we're not at the highest level percentage wise. But we are we we come we've come up from zero at such a quick rate that there's a lot of lags that were built up and bleeding through. And now a lot of people in this in the last year or so have claimed, oh, the Fed lags aren't real. There are no such thing as Fed lags. It doesn't exist. And the reason they're saying this, look, the stock market's up. The Fed hiked the stock market's up. Economy's fine. Yes. W- w- now, if a recession happened tomorrow, everyone would come back to the table and be like, oh, I guess Fed ha- Fed, uh, Fed lags are real. Right. That's how yeah, this works. Well, I mean, like the speed at which they hiked rates, I think is going to be a similar speed that we're going to see those legs come to fruition. It's going to just hit like a brick wall. I, yeah. I, and I, I don't see how it, it wouldn't. 
that's kind of just and how you're going to need the work. Fed to cut, right? You're going to need the Fed to cut into that into into that brick wall. You're going to want to have the Fed coming down into that brick wall, not just staying high and almighty right through it, right? You're going to want the Fed to be at least easing into it, yeah. at least. And the problem is, is does the Fed pick up on that information fast enough to start the easing path, the the the, the, uh, the easy the easing policy path? And that's ultimately the driver of stage four. That's what we think is the likely outcome. Is the Fed's not going to be able to manage all this all at once. Um, and ultimately, we get the recession uh, because the Fed stayed too high, too long. This will go down in the history books as the Fed-induced recession. Um, basically, they over the economy. And in the process, they um, inadvertently, from trying to kill inflation, they killed the economy. And they could have saved both, but they didn't act efficiently enough. That's typically how it works with the Fed. But I mean, listen, again, Nothing is guaranteed. Could the Fed pull this off? Yes, that's why we're open-minded. Stage three is, is where we are right now. It's what's been going on. And until we actually see the broadening signals of a, a real economic slowdown, not just a, we, a weaker growth environment, meaning you know actual negative gro growth strength and, and, and bonds really bidding and pushing up like TLT, TLT down here, this is not recessionary, right? We need to see TLT up in a bullish trend at a minimum. That at least gives us, okay, look, there's a, there's a bid coming in for, for bonds now. These are the signs that like, okay, stage four is, is nearing. Until then, stage three, normalization, soft landing, whatever you want to call it, it's playing on in full force. And until, um, until we see this, uh, this shift happen, this is going to be the game plan. Now, it might mean, look, the long end might play some games. The long end might want to try and push up higher in yield. But all that's going to happen is, um, like all that has to happen is something like today, right? The, the long end yields are down, bonds are up because of this GDP revision, this 30 basis point GDP revision pretty much put in a low as of right now for bonds, for long bonds. And it's just the gradual slowdown of growth where the bond markets are actually sniffing out a slowdown. And that's really what will take bonds um, higher and yields lower. And you're in this position where like you're going to need the economy to really overheat, overheat to blow out the long end, in my opinion. I'm not saying the long end's going up from here because I don't think the risk to reward trade's there. I think that we're in a position where bearish trends tend to lead to lower prices. Long end can go down, long end rates can go up, long end, long, uh, long end bonds can go down, long end rates can go up. But I don't think we're, we're in this type of environment where we were in 2023, 20, even late 2023, or 2022, late 2023. I think we're in this chopping phase. and. Yeah, you might get chopped up and um, it might not be worth the coupons. If, if growth is still somewhat resilient, equities will chug along and you'll, you'll find better returns in equities. So um, as, you can, as you guys know, we don't long uh, bearish trends. So we're obviously not long bonds. We have not been long bonds um, this entire time. Ever since the Fed started hiking rates, we were the advocates saying bond prices are going down um, and everyone was trying to catch the... the, the the falling knife. Remember, buy bonds, wear diamonds, that whole thing. Everyone was trying to fish the, the lows on bonds and the bonds have not materially accelerated from 2022. I mean, even if you look at it on this chart, we are at 2022 lows right now on bonds. Like if you yeah. bought bonds- I mean, we, we outperformed uh, most of the macro guys just by staying in cash. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. And like the, the question now is going to be, you know, do, do you try and front run the recession? And I think that's a lethal trade. Because all that has to happen is, you know, long ends go, long end goes down. And especially if you're using leverage, you just get whacked. Like all that has to happen is long end rates go up, the long end bonds go down, whatever it may be. If it's, you know, if it's just a squeeze, if it's, you know, a, a 10, I don't know, a 10 basis point, 15 basis point squeeze on the long end, everyone, you know, everyone's going to get all shaken out and, and you're going to experience some pain there where you don't necessarily achieve anything, especially with leverage, you're not even getting the coupon payments, right? Because um, if you're using TMF, you're, you're not really getting coupon payments. Um, and you're just eating a, a drawdown for no reason. So I think that's like the key here is we want to strike the iron when it's hot, when bonds are trending and the, and, and the economy or the market's really sniffing out that, that recession, that material growth slowdown, that's when you want to strike bonds. Unless you're a pension fund trying to clip coupons, it's nonsense, in my opinion, to be buying bonds right now. I, I think that's where we're going to wrap up this podcast, though. Thank you guys so much for listening. If you want to find out more about what we offer in our quant deck and our tools, you can go to our website at market-radar.com, or you can go to our X page at the market radar. Thank you so much and share with your friends.